What's up, my ninjas, and welcome back to another superhero film attack. It's been a while, and since it is the 50th anniversary of G.I. Joe, uh, I figured I will focus on G.I. Joe, and we'll be reviewing G.I. Joe the movie. Um, if you're kind of like me, and you grew up in the 80s, and you know, you're at least in your 30s, I think I was, what, seven when uh, G.I. Joe the movie came out, and I was a little younger when the show dropped? I think I was like five. Um, then you have fond memories of this stuff, you know? This is kind of what gave you the one of your first glimpses of what superheroics look like, and it tied it into the real world without being 100% the real world. You know, this is what made me such a big fan. You know, as a kid, you want to see, uh, you know, heroes that look like adults and, you know, that, that look like what you want to grow up to be. You want to see them overcome you know, crazy odds, and you want to learn a little bit, because, you know, you're a kid. You don't know you want to learn, but you do want to, like, see how grown-ups do these things, because you want to have that kind of freedom, you want to grow up to be like that, and G.I. Joe was all this in a nutshell. Um, as a kid, I didn't have very many G.I. Joes, but I did watch the show all the time. Now, as you guys know, and as you've seen all across all of these videos I've done, I'm a huge G.I. Joe fan, and I was able to reconnect with that portion of my childhood via the various versions of G.I. Joe. Now, I'm not even going to pretend the TV show was, was okay, but the movie, I love the movie. So... I'm going to try to be as unbiased as I possibly can because this is, after all, a review. And, you know, it's not perfect, but I love the movie. Now, um, what the movie does over the show is it changes a lot of things that, uh, that you know, uh, it doesn't change them. It ramps up the stakes. Things that you know the show to be, things that you know happen, things you know the characters will do, you see it here, but you see it in a more... Um, in a way that doesn't detract from the main story because there is a main story a main overarching idea that's in here now much like transformers the movie the overarching purpose of this film was to get the old guys out and bring in the new guys um there's all these little things that i will go over that i mean most of you guys probably know but the things they did well was this or one of the major things they did very well was that this universe that G.I. Joe took place in, it was influenced by things that were happening in the real world at the time, but those things didn't really, uh, it wasn't the real world. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like a, a uh, imaginary version of the real world. So, you know, you had your various military powers, you had all these different countries, real and fake, um, or, you know, fictional and the real ones. Um, you had, you know, the military specialties, but the way that a lot of these things were used was not the traditional way. You know what I mean? It wasn't the way it is in the real world, you know? Um, and I love that idea. And it's something that I don't understand how a lot of modern fans don't see this or don't get it or they forgot. I mean, they're too busy being grown up to remember that this is what got you into this shit in the first place. G.I. Joe the movie, in the first what three four minutes of the film or whatever minute of the film however long the intro is they solidify what i just told you a thousand percent now the intro is awesome because you see cobra just attack ellis island they don't show any remorse they show up they just start stomping folks punching cameras just they ramsack this fucking, uh, you know, Ellis Island. They want to, you can tell that they are trying to do something to the Statue of Liberty. And, of course, you know that the Joes wouldn't let something like that go unchallenged. So, out of nowhere, a shot hits Major Blood's uh, glider. And guess who it is? It's Duke. Ready to wreck shop on that ass. And then with their jump packs, you see Joes just emerge from the torch of the Statue of Liberty and all hell breaks loose in the most patriotic display of, of heroism and just ridiculousness that you will ever see. Um, this is one of those things that, as a kid, it just immediately sucked you in and you couldn't, you know, even as an adult, you know, you cry man tears when you see this shit because it's so good and it's so good in a way that we don't get anymore. 
They're not taking themselves too seriously. It's blowing up the Statue of Liberty is along the lines of something that Cobra would do, and it's along the lines of something that terrorists do. We know this shit now in the world that we live in because we've seen this stuff. Um, you see all the Joes doing what they do on display. You get the explanation for who Cobra is and who G.I. Joe is, and you just see them doing what they do best, and that's kicking the shit out of one another and making it look good all the way. Cobra Commander sees he's losing, uh, calls for the retreat. Duke sees the bomb, flies down to the bomb, picks it up, uses his pack, flies back up to the ship from where all the you know, Cobra troopers and vehicles and stuff are coming from. Puts the bomb on the ship, kicks off the ship in such a superheroic kind of way, and then flies away. The bomb goes off, and he just, they blow up the, I mean, he probably killed a ton of people, which you, you know it happens. Um, this is the thing that I like about the show and what I've always liked about it, because it's, it's not the real world. The bad guys are supposed to get beaten and killed, you know, and sometimes the good guys are too, but... You know, G.I. Joe always kind of skirted around these issues in a good kind of way because it never took away from the story, you know? And then as if possessed by Captain America himself, like a good little soldier, like a good sentinel of liberty, uh, Duke flies down, sees the statue of, I mean, I'm sorry, the American flag laying on the ground. He flies by and picks it up because it's up to him to, you know, keep that flag flying. And, uh... It was, it's dope because it's super patriotic. I mean, now it kind of seems ham, like, like overdone. I don't want to say ham-fisted, but just overdone. But given the world they live in where they can uphold some certain things, it just fits. So he flies the, stat, the, the flag up to the top of the Statue of Liberty with his fellow Joes, and they wave the flag in victory. That's an intro. You know, and, and I don't understand how in, in the first couple minutes of this film they could drive this point home and in two movies gi joe couldn't get the the new joes they can't get this right the joes aren't very good at doing what they're supposed to do yeah they can shoot people but what else can they do you know um i also like how they didn't leave all of the main action to snake eyes in this intro you see snake eyes for a brief second and everybody gets their shine time that's how it's done this puts you on the path to what's one of the best gi joe movies ever Now, overall, the idea is you have issues over on the Cobra side, and you have issues on the Joe side. In the mean, uh, meantime, there is a mission that the Joes are going on with a device called the uh, BET, and I'll get to that in a second. But anyway, on the Cobra side, there's this power struggle. And you know, there, before it was a two-way power struggle, and now with the uh, introduction of Serpentor, in one of my favorite multi-part episodes, Arise, Serpentor, Arise, you have Serpentor and Cobra Commander and Destro still fighting for power. Here, you have uh, Serpentor pretty much calling out Cobra Commander on all his bullshit. He's saying, dude, like, you pretty much suck. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're the commander of Cobra, and I haven't seen you do shit. You run away from battles. You don't actually take out any Joes. You, none of your plans work. And then you point fingers at everyone else when the situation falls down around you so you know you need to pay for what you've done you know essentially and cobra commander flips it and says no it's your fault and everybody's like what the fuck like really are you serious and uh during this there is an assassination attempt well what looks like an assassination attempt on serpentor's life and Cobra Commander takes this opportunity to do what he thinks would allow for the uh, assailant to kill Serpentor. And he kind of guides everybody in the opposite direction of where he clearly sees the uh, intruder going. And uh, his plan, of course, backfires. And later on, you are re you are uh, uh, it's revealed that uh, the, pers the person who came and, and broke into the Terradome is actually on the side of Cobra with their own agenda that they need Serpentor for. Now over here on the Joe side, I love this part. This is like part of my favorite thing in the film. Beachhead's one of my favorite characters, if not my, my top favorite Joe. Um, and Beachhead, he was fairly new. He showed up in Arise, Serpentor, Arise, and uh, 
he wasn't a drill sergeant then. Somehow that's what he got relegated to in this film. And he is training the next group of new Joes that they were trying to force onto us, which none of them except for maybe Tunnel Rat and Chuckles. Well, actually a few of them because Jinx, she stuck around. She became pretty popular. Tunnel Rat and Chuckles. Chuckles really, he's one of my favorites now. Big Lob, fuck Big Lob. A lot of us have issues with that character and uh, he just wasn't a good idea. But anyway, you're seeing him train these 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 uh, kind of green, kind of rough around the edges, new recruits that just, you know, they, they need the attention. <laughs> and Beachhead is all about perfection, all about doing everything right. So he's not letting them get away with shit. He's making sure that he is on top of them 100% of the way, which is pretty cool. But there's supposed to be six of them. And one of them decided to shirk his duties, shirk his training, because he had a date, which of course, you know, a date's more important than your uh, training. Uh, and of course that person is none other than Lieutenant Falcon. That's another character that a lot of us don't like, you know, fuck Falcon. So he's on his date with a chick named Heather, or so she says. You find out that, uh, and I'm gonna kind of simplify a lot of, you know, the plot, but uh, he's showing off his duties and he's lying about what he does and saying, you know, he does more, he's more important, he's in charge of the G.I. Joe team just so he can get some tang. And he is discovered by Duke, who you find out is his half-brother, and uh, pretty much he gets in a little bit of trouble for what he does. Back at the Cobra camp, we're introduced to Pythona. She's the quote-unquote assassin. She broke into the Pterodrome to find Serpentor and tell him about a plan uh, that they need his help for and that he comes from where she comes from and they're responsible for him actually being there and he should come back with her to a place called Cobra La. Of course the Joes are elsewhere and they're working on working with this device called the BET. BET stands for the Broadcast Energy Transmitter, not Black Entertainment Television. It would have been awesome if they were trying to destroy Black Entertainment Television. <laughs> but um, pretty much this thing just shoots energy to wherever you need it. So it's it's kind of a MacGuffin for the story, but not so much because there is a pretty clear-cut explanation for it, how the world's having an energy crisis and the Joes, part of their work you know, protecting the world is, you know, helping it wherever they can, which is good, you know, showing you how good these guys are. Cobra, of course, shows up, tries to take it. There's a big battle. The Joes start winning and they push Cobra back. Cobra Commander is like, hey, we can hide out in this place. Follow me. And they retreat to the mountains and they get there and they start seeing weird shit. And when I say weird shit, I'm talking like, welcome to Cobra La. <laughs> I'm talking like Gears of War weird shit. They're like, what the heck? Like, what the hell is all this stuff? And you, you know, you're explain. It's explained to us and to them that they are in a really old civilization that Cobra Commander is actually a part of, or was a part of before he became Cobra Commander. Um, and this is Cobra La. Through Cobra La, we are introduced to a whole bunch of cool shit. Cool artwork, cool images, cool backgrounds. This beast of a man known as Nemesis Enforcer, who kind of, he's the muscle for, uh, you know, the guys in charge in Cobra La, or the man in charge at uh, Cobra La, which is uh, the man that's responsible for putting Cobra Commander on his way. They lay waste to the Joes that actually chase them down into Cobra La, we're introduced to Galobulus. Galobulus explains, uh, you know, who he is and what Serpentor is and why he needed Serpentor in the first place, what the plan was. And then he also explains to us what the significance was of Cobra Commander. We get kind of like Cobra Commander's backstory through uh, Galobulus, which is crazy because we're like, who is this dude? And then all of a sudden, you know, he's like, oh, you failed us. You know, we put you, I gave you this position. I did all this stuff for you. You were so promising and you failed. And we're like, holy shit, this guy knows Cobra Commander. So all this time we thought Cobra Commander was just some guy in a mask, you know, covering his face just for the sake of. And it turns out he's part of Cobra Law, this super advanced uh, biological, uh, I'm sorry, tech, 
techno-organic civilization that had existed since before Cro-Magnon men, before the, you know, our, our, our earliest man, and they want their planet back. And essentially, Cobra Commander was sent out into the world to get it back by force, using, you know, our tech against us. And he failed miserably. And Galobulus is not happy about it. So he explains that they have this plan that involves these giant fungusoids that you see, you, we saw them as soon as they got into uh, Cobra Law, which is kind of under a, an ice dome that kind of looks like a mountain from the outside. And uh, these things are supposed to ripen, and when they ripen, uh, under, I think, extreme temperatures or something, which is crazy because, you know, once they get inside, it's not all snow and ice and shit, it's kind of like... I don't know, it's all kinds of things. You're seeing rivers and lakes and you're seeing uh, 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 foliage and you're seeing, you know, bugs and you're seeing like kind of tropical, you know, almost rainforesty, but it's under, uh, uh, you know, the ice dome. I think they're in, are they in Alaska? They're either in Alaska or Antarctica. I can't remember which, which pole or which place they're at. But, um, so it's just like there's this whole kind of Eden underneath the ice. And they're explaining once these things are exposed to heat, they will, uh, like extreme temperatures, they will actually start to ripen. And when they ripen, they will shoot off into space. Um, when they shoot off into space, they will, you know, blow up. And the uh, insides will kind of shower the earth and it will de-evolve us. And to do this, they need the BET to create that heat. So pretty much they task Serpentor with getting a team together to go... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm messing. I'm messing up. They had tasked him to get the BET to do this. So Pentor fails, gets captured, and a new team is going to be sent to break him out with uh, Nemesis Enforcer involved in it. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Falcon fucks up again, and uh, in the process, he was supposed to help guard uh, Serpentor, and of course, he was out screwing around with Jinx. Um, which is one of the relationships that they're trying to build throughout this this thing. First, you think dude's just into random broads, it doesn't matter. But then you see that Jinx is kind of jealous because her and him kind of had a thing, and he's just always chasing tail. So anyway, because he screws up, uh, I think it's Gung Ho, Alpine, and uh, Bazooka get their asses throttled, um, which is, of course, another way for them to get them out of the, the show, you know what I'm saying, so that you can have room for these new guys. So their base is in shambles. I mean, they've destroyed so much. The uh, strike team that was sent to get Serpentor actually managed to get through all of the safeguards and get, or the security mes measures, and get Serpentor. Um, and it's all because of Falcon. He would have been the early warning for something like this were it to actually happen. And it did happen. Um, pretty much as a result of this, uh, Falcon gets court-martialed. During the court-martial, Duke decides to kind of stand up for him and kind of vouch and let them know that, you know, he he planned on, uh, he was told by their mother to take care of him, you know, watch, look out for him, and that they're half-brothers. And I guess because Duke is such a high-ranking member, and, you know, he's such a perfect Joe, they decide, okay, fine, we won't strip him of his rank, we won't kick him out of the Joes, instead we'll find a... Uh, a different way to retrain him to get him you know to teach him what it means to really be a Joe and he gets sent off to the slaughterhouse second favorite Joe of all time and I still don't have a figure of this guy because his figure goes for ignorant prices it was a comic-con exclusive or Joe con exclusive one of the convention exclusives anyway sergeant slaughter uh, he runs the slaughterhouse they send Falcon to the slaughterhouse to make him a real Joe. They're like, you know, you, you need to learn what it means to serve, and this guy is going to do that. So uh, Slaughter has his, uh, they were called the Marauders back then. I don't know what they're called now. I think they're still called Slaughter's Marauders. But anyway, it's uh, Taurus, uh, Red Dog, and Mercer who you'll see in the next picture. And essentially these guys are just so rough, so raw, and so kind of like, they're not the best examples of soldiers personality wise, but once they get in the field, these motherfuckers get shit done and they don't even play around. They do exactly what needs to be done. Um, 
and you you see a transformation with uh, Falcon, and he kind of learns the you know the error of his way. He starts to learn the errors of, the error of his ways. He starts to understand teamwork. He starts to understand the importance of sticking to the protocol when it comes to these combat situations because obviously people can die, you know. And because he's out here in the middle of fucking nowhere, he's not being given the opportunity to fuck up, you know. When he screws up. It's kind of like the way we trained at our school. Um, if one person, you know, misbehaves or acts dumb in the class, then we all have to do drills. But then on the flip side, if one person can't get a technique, then we all have to help them learn the technique because we can't be done until we can't move on to the next thing until we all understand what the last thing was. So it creates this sense of brotherhood and you have this kind of strong uh, bond with your teammates. And that's what he ends up learning. Now, the other Joes that got captured during the, the entrance or entry to Cobra La, they're being, you know, beat up and they're in a holding cell and uh, Roadblock manages to make a, a run for it. And uh, he comes across what's left of Cobra Commander who uh, was punished for his failure by being fed these spores that actually, it's the same spores that would degenerate mankind once they're fired over the earth. Um, they put the spores in his face, he turns into a, uh, he's turning back into a snake, I guess, because that's what he evolved from, I, I, I guess. I mean, I don't, they don't really explain it, but it's an awesome visual. And uh, Roadblock was beginning to fight with uh, Nemesis Enforcer and he got blinded by some weird something that Nemesis Enforcer, you know, hit in his eyes or opened in his eyes. So uh, pretty much these two are relying on each other with com the commander being the eyes and, you know, Roadblock being the, the legs. Anyway, uh, the BET has moved to a new place to be, you know, out of the way from the craziness that happened with Falcon prior to these events. Uh, Baroness catches when she was in, in disguise and she gets word back to Cobra La and the rest of Cobra to let them know where the BET is. They hit that base hard, snatch the BET, fight. Uh, Serpentor comes down to personally get Duke because Duke beat his ass the first time. So he's like, shit, I need my revenge. He uh, sees Falcon in the middle of all this. He's about to actually throw one of his snakes that he hardened and turns into a spear. He's about to throw it at Falcon. And it, uh, as it's about to hit him, Duke jumps in the way, takes it, it hits him in the heart. We're treated to our first little bit of blood. I mean, I was like seven when this movie came out. So I was like, what the fuck? You know, first Optimus Prime and now this? Like, what the fuck? And Duke is in a coma. So, uh, of course, this now sets Falcon on his path. Now, you know, with Falcon being set on his path, the idea is it's setting the stage for all the Joes to end up going back to Cobra Law, and the big shit breaking happens, and they gotta get back to BET, and they gotta stop Cobra Law from shoot, using it to shoot off the spores, etc., etc., so we know what's going on. One of the things that I see as a huge criticism amongst, like, Joe fans is Cobra Law. Look at this image. That's fucking awesome. It's weird as fuck. But it's awesome. As soon as we're introduced to Python in the beginning of the movie, you're seeing weird image imagery that's like the opposite of what you had been seeing throughout most of the, the TV series up to this point. I mean, you had weird things like in Arise, Serpentor, Arise, where you had that that blob monster that was running around, you know, like a rabid dog and shit like that. But and you had the germ, but you didn't have shit like this. You know what I mean? These weird sphincter things i don't know what you call them or like this tangler thing that shoots out the the stuff or this weird eel multi-eel thing or globulus and his flying tumor body you know what i mean um serpentor we were introduced to him in a tv series and you you learn how they they comb the cat the, the the graves of all these great warriors and and dictators and you know people try, that were trying to rule the world in some kind of way, and they put them together to make this perfect being, and you find out that what you saw happen in the TV series was actually implanted by Galobulus in, excuse me, in uh, Dr. Mindbender's brain with a device that looks like a little spider that they called a psychic motivator. This shit is 
priceless. Like, could you imagine this in live action? Then on top of that, we get Cobra Commander's backstory where they tell you he was a brilliant young scientist and he showed the most promise of all of the, the, the you know, I don't know if there was a school or something, but just of all the people that they were considering for the role of, of, of the commander, he was the smartest. He was the one with the most skills. He's the one they, they saw the most promise in, so they're like, hey, let's do it. So he had an accident. I guess he mixed things he shouldn't have mixed, or he was messing with the spores once before, and it fucked him up, and that's why he wears the mask. Notice that in this image, this is Cobra Commander before all that shit. In this image, he's like blue or gray. When, he, when you see him with the hood on, he's got, like, tan skin. I mean, does he paint his skin around the eyes so that he appears to be a white guy under the suit? Mmm, I don't know. But, uh, it's just cool backstory that if this was in live action, could you imagine how crazy this shit could go? And somehow people are saying, oh, this is stupid. You, you've played Gears of War 1 through 3, and that was fine, but this was Gears of War 30 years before... Gears of War, and it's it's not cool. Um, Nemesis Enforcer, really cool uh, villain that doesn't say much, but he's clearly put here to be a physical threat to a couple of the Joes that are pretty physical, but mostly Sergeant Slaughter, because no one was on Sergeant Slaughter's uh, level as far as, you know, physicality and whatnot. And Nemesis Enforcer takes down a Havoc with his bare hands. So yeah, this guy is beyond you know, a physical threat for any Joe. You know, he could take quick kicks kicks. He can, you know, easily match up with Roadblock or Gung Ho or any of the bigger Joes. So he definitely would be a match for Sergeant Slaughter. Um, the fact that you see Cobra Commander D evolve, that's fucking amazing. Like, what cartoon before this, besides maybe in Humanoids, gave you this kind of a... Um, you know, like a, these stakes, you know, for a movie of a TV show that kids are supposed to be watching, they really went in and they gave us like serious drama and they didn't just like beat around the bush. Things like these weird bomb, trillabug, whatever you want to call them, trillamites, trilla something, they just look gross. And these things are explosives. They, you know, they let them go, they run under stuff and they blow up. I mean, all this shit feels like, like I said, Gears of War, like tickers. Those are like, the tickers before the tickers. Just imagine if this was um, a live action film again, and you have that whole uh, John Carpenter, you know, the thing kind of feel to all these weird monsters and stuff. Then look at the design of that throne room or that main, you know, whatever you want to call it. That's just, it looks like shit that would be in, in heavy metal, the magazine. It doesn't look like typical G.I. Joe. It's like they took the concept of G.I. Joe and have them protecting the world from threats, you know, foreign and domestic, but this time they made it a foreign threat that actually is domestic. They're, they were on the earth before we were, you know? The path of esteem, quote unquote. It's, it's the red carpet, but it's made up of crabs. All this stuff, this organic, you know, shit that, that, that Cobra Law is using. It's just weird and it's gross, but it's awesome because they thought of it. Even the plot, it's deeper than your typical, I'm the bad guy and this is the good guy that you normally got with G.I. Joe. Here you have people who lived here first and then this new species popped up, evolved into destroying to create. You know, if we can't tame the land naturally, we always bulldoze that shit you know chop it down and build something to allow us to have a better hold on things and that's the way it is meanwhile these guys can do this kind of shit that's like a, a fucking uh, what do they call those things uh it's like a hologram of some sort but it's coming out of a fucking clam what i mean this stuff is just insane and somehow people think it's lame look at this door that's inside the ice and it's made up of all these tendrils and stuff all these images would be awesome in a live action film. And it, 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 it hurts my feelings that no producers, no directors, and a lot of fans don't have the, the capacity or the imagination to see how this would actually make the Joes look better. I mean, you can only do terrorist plots so much and it gets tired. You have to throw something else in there. I mean, look at this fucking flying slug taco that's an actual ship. 
there's people in there. So Pentor is on that ship and there's guys in the eyeball looking things controlling this ship. I mean, whew, the amount of thought that went into all this is just insane to me. You know, it's just insane. And it's coming from left field. And like I said, this is what they were using. It's completely natural before we started with our tech. I mean, really look at this stuff. I mean, like, this shit is gross. Like, it's really gross. And it could have, it, it would make, it was already good in animation, but it would make for some amazing visuals when the textures and the actual mechanics are worked out in real life for, you know, in a live action feature. I mean, I'm telling you some concept artists and animators would go nuts to actually work with this shit, you know, because it's mixing horror movie elements and sci-fi elements in a military themed uh, superhero kind of opus, you know what I'm saying? And you can go nuts having them fight these things because you can show how their individual skills actually allow for them to deal with these kind of threats. Granted, the fun part would be them reacting to all this crazy shit being thrown at them, but it would be awesome to see, you know, this is what an infiltration specialist would do if he gets swallowed by, you know, a monster. Or, you know, this is what the survivalist would do if these living vines try to kill him. And I'm sad that Outback wasn't in here because we could have seen that, you know what I mean? But, uh, you know, they could have expanded on that. Because what they did here was, it was kind of like Power Rangers logic. Because they needed to get captured so that they could be out of the way, so that the new Joes, the rawhides as they called them, could actually act. They all had to get snatched up regardless of how skilled they were. To me, that's, you know, it's a cartoon, so I can give them, you know, their, I can give them the, 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 the pass for that, because I get it. It's kind of like, this has to happen so that other things can happen, and I understand why. Um, but if it was live action, they could cut out some of the stuff that wasn't necessary, because the movie's not that long. I know it's under two hours. Um, and it's very well done, you know, in an episodic kind of way. I mean, look at the, the area where uh, Cobra Commander's trial is taking place with that clam that's holding him in place. That's pretty imaginative, you know? And it's not stuff that you would have... It's not the typical things I would have imagined from, you know, G.I. Joe and Cobra, you know? Never, up until this point, I never really thought about Cobra being anything but bad guys from all over Europe coming together to you know, try to take over the world. And then they throw this in there and you're like, whoa, what the heck? Even as a kid, you're like, whoa, this is crazy. But it's so well thought out. You know, I have to reiterate, these guys have been on the planet since before humans. And then humans evolve, start screwing things up, and they have to retreat back to these kind of areas where people don't normally go. It's not a lot of people around here so that they can actually have their little piece of this planet to themselves. And they're not cool with it. Look at these planes that look like, like they said, salad. <laughs> and they're shooting, shooting uh, like tendrils and, 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 and calamari or something at, at the, the, the whatever. It's just... The, the amount of thought, the fact that they're, everything they use is organic, none of it, their technology is organic, so none of it is, you know, the kind of stuff we use, so there's plant-based things, everything's alive, essentially, you know, and they found a way to harness and control all these living things to use to fight the Joes. It's just an awesome, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's an awesome counter to the Joes who are all about tech because they're people and that's the way we do things, you know? The Joes had jetpacks and shit. I mean, just imagine what you see in the intro and then what you see by the end of the film, you're just like, whoa, just like they said, it's like the Twilight Zone. All of a sudden, they're just fighting shit that it's like, how the fuck are you supposed to deal with this? This isn't what we trained for. This isn't what we signed on for. But they got to figure out how to deal with it. Like this flying crab bat thing. What the fuck? You know what I mean? Like, what? Actually, I shouldn't even say crab bat. That's more like a crab dragonfly or something. I don't know. Those wings are crazy. But it's like they went to hell. You know what I'm saying? Uh, look at this big old mantis that served as like a bridge of some sort. 
a small bridge, I think. Yeah, he was a small bridge because they were running on his back. And then when Sarge was about to, you know, be on the at the other end, it woke up and looked at him like, hey, what the fuck, dude, you need to get off my back. And of course, you know, the Sarge being who he is, he's not going to sit there and be like, oh, you know, the mission is, is going on and this bug wants me to respectfully move from his back. He pretty much was like, no, you got to go back to sleep on me. And he knocked him out. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we love the character because it didn't matter what the threat was he was out of ammunition and he still was like dude I'm gonna knock this thing out because it needs to be done so I can get where I gotta go and the other Joes can come after me so there are a lot of things you know I took the time to, to kind of focus on Cobra Law because there are a lot of things that uh, people kind of they, they dismiss about this movie and this movie is an example of using your imagination to kind of further the legend of these characters, you know? A lot of shows tend to just redo what was done in the show, in the film. And, then, and sometimes it's good, don't get me wrong. But sometimes you need more. I like escalation. And I like the idea of the odds being upped so high that the things you're seeing, it's like, what? Like this bridge. The first time I saw the movie, I think I saw the movie, I saw it with my mom, and I can't remember where we saw it, but I know uh, the first time I saw it, maybe it was on TV when they showed it in parts, I can't remember, but uh, I remember my mom reacting to this bridge when it moved and turned around and flipped up and you see it's a giant bug that's like on his back, like laying down in between this space. like. That's gross. <laughs> it's fucking gross, but it's brilliant because not only did they animate it in a way that makes it actually feel like a bug, but it's not what we were expecting. I mean, granted, once we get down here, we're like, yeah, all the weird shit that they're going to throw at us, we know weird shit is going to happen because we're in Cobra Law and that's kind of the, the order of the day, you know, but the Joes didn't know that or my favorite thing here is when Tunnel Rat trips and falls into that giant slug and then shoots his way out of the side and comes out looking all crazy and shit. It's things like this help make the character that much more interesting and more memorable, you know what I'm saying? So you're not feeling like, you, you know, they're going through the motions. You're feeling like your character is being put through the meat grinder and when he gets through the other end, he's going to be a little bit different from, you know, what he was when he started. Now, as dope as the movie is, there's a couple things that don't work for me. Um, from the fact that the movie focuses on Falcon, you know, the fact that there was a focus on trying to introduce all these new Joes that were younger and whatnot and less uh, seasoned and taking that away from the characters who we know are capable, you know, instead of having them work side by side, you know what I mean? Like, like partner them up with, with, uh, you know, seasoned Joes and then have them achieve their goals. Instead, they were like, here, let's throw all these new characters the bone and, you know, or throw them the ball, I'm sorry, and let them carry the, the movie. And that's not the way to go, in my uh, opinion. It didn't turn out horrible, but I think it would have been better if they didn't try to be so blatant with their marketing and try to give us all this shit that we didn't necessarily need in an effort to kind of extend the brand. You know what I mean? Um, big lob. That's another problem I have. You had all these diverse soldiers in G.I. Joe. Guys from Hawaii. You had uh, Joes from, you know, the inner cities of the United States. You had, uh, you know, you didn't have many brown Cobras, if any. But you had brown Joes. And a lot of them all had different kind of specialties, different personalities. None of them really felt racist. And then we get Big Lob. Really? Now, I know there were a lot of sports-themed Joes, but a tall basketball-playing soldier, and like, and that's his specialty, is that he's just real physical, and he can shoot his grenades like basketballs. Like, get the fuck out of here with that shit. Honestly. You know, I, I, and, and I never was a fan of, like, The Fridge or Captain Gridiron. Like, in, in theory, it seems like a cool idea, but in application, it just seems stupid. You see this guy wearing fucking 
you know, football armor, then your marksman wants to shoot him in between the bars on his football helmet. You know what I mean? He's not trying to sit there and, like, tackle him on the field or some shit. It just doesn't work. It's too out there even for this. Now, if he had the name, the nickname, but he didn't look like a football player, he had armor on, and it's like he operated much like a football player, I'd be like, that makes sense. Same thing with Big Love. If you gave him a different name, because that name is stupid, give him a different code name, and then if you said, you know, part of his background, like, he has to have, like, actual training. Because you, that's not good enough for you to join the team. Is that you used to play basketball? Sorry. But there should be something else, you know? Maybe he's the marksman. You know what I mean? Maybe he's a marksman and he used to play basketball. And there's an, a, a scene where he has to try and blow up a, something and he has a grenade and he shoots it. And you're like, oh, okay, fine. That makes sense. He was a basketball player. But to make him black with this Harlem Globetrotters hairstyle you know from like the fucking 60s or 50s and it just he just doesn't work for me and it pissed me off even when i was a kid and it still pisses me off just looking at him now as an adult that was a no no on their part they really should have known better honestly um then there's also the uh strange usage of the new characters you know like chuckles really serve no purpose he threw a missile with his bare hands, and then he pulled the calamari off the uh, the blades of the uh, tomahawk. And that's it. He does nothing else. Um, the only characters of any type of relevance were Jinx, Tunnel Rat, and Falcon. Freaking uh, uh, Law and Order they didn't do shit they just had action figures and they had the scene when you when they were introduced and that's it so my big gripe is that they introduced a lot of characters that took up screen time that could have been given to other people and law and order aren't one of them because they only have the one scene and then they're in the background alongside other characters every other time you see them uh, another uh, complaint that I have is that the three-way power struggle that they had going on with, you know, uh, uh, Cobra Commander, Destro, and Serpentor just seemed like a, a little bit much. You know, get one of them out the way. Like, they should have went all the way and had somebody sabotage someone and kill them and then just take their spot. And then show us that's how treacherous Cobra is. Instead of this, like, dysfunctional family kind of bullshit that they had going on where you, you know, you have the, the capable, you know, one guy the one brother that's super capable the other brother that's like overzealous but he is also capable and then the other brother who's just delusions of grandeur out the anus and, and no skills so you know which one the fuck up is and the other two are the ones everybody looks to like it's funny in the beginning and then it got tired even as a child it was stressful because it was like can we like decide which one is the leader and you know when you're a kid and you're collecting all these figures you sometimes, especially when it's a TV show, you base the characterization that you want to give the characters off of what you saw in the show. With me, I was happy that I never was able to find Serpentor, so I just had Destro and Cobra Commander. For a long time, I only had Destro, and that's why he's one of my favorite Cobras. So I was able to make Destro really hardcore, and the Joes that I had spent most of their time fighting Destro. By the time I got Cobra Commander and the others... I already had my Joe team and the way they deal with stuff down, and I also had Destro stick down. I think they should have decided which one of these guys was going to be the main villain, because, you know, they all don't really fit in this, uh, you know, film. And it's weird because, like, Cobra Commander and Destro both take a backseat to Serpentor in this film when you could have just had Destro shoot Cobra Commander and actually lead Cobra and have him as the right hand to... Serpentor, and that would have been awesome. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, you know, that weird focus, the multi directional focus that this film has, kind of, it can hurt in some ways. You know, I've heard a lot of people say, and I've read a lot of people saying that this film, just because of the fact that it, it threw everyone for a loop with all the weird shit that they threw into it, that it, it, may, it means the movie sucks. No, it doesn't, because Transformers did the same shit. They went to the planet of junk and they're singing and they're dancing and whatnot. I had never seen a dance number in a, uh, a Transformers episode 
like singing and dancing. I mean, there was break dancing and stuff, but there was never singing and dancing. And then you had that shit. And then you had the shark decons that were just weird. I guess because they have big sharp teeth and they're monsters, they don't look like sharks. But somehow that works. But Cobra Law doesn't. I don't know. I honestly don't see how you know there's there's ish, there can be issues with the one and not the other. Um, it's 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 all in the same vein in my opinion and i think it works well on both sides they just needed to tweak some things and i wish they would revisit this material and just tweak things you know tonally tweak things the comedy can still be there to some degree but make the joes actually have a way of operating make the cobra law um the, the citizens of cobra law have a way of you know operating because they actually succeed at doing what it is they set out to do the joes actually have to stop it while the plan is underway and to me that's awesome because that shows that these guys aren't fucking around meanwhile cobra commander has been screwing around with his people and they can't get their plans off the ground because they bicker and they fight with each other so much so anyway that's one of the things that didn't work for me um another thing that didn't work for me is uh Characters like Duke, when it's a movie with these characters in them, they're so instrumental in the overarching story. You know, Duke and Flint, like what was Flint doing during all this shit, you know? Um, you can't just show them to us when they're talking and they're trying to formulate the plan unless that's where you're going to relegate them to. If they're going to stay in the ready room and shout out orders to the teams that are out actually doing things, then okay that's cool but if you're gonna have them in the movie as active members you know you need to have them doing something show them leading their teams to do things and and show what happens with them it just felt like i guess this goes back to one of the earlier points i made in this portion is that there's a lot of characters that are you know supposed to be in the forefront that took a backseat to these lame ass new characters and the new characters didn't even get fleshed out enough to deserve all that time you know something could have happened to kick half of these guys out and then just focus on you know the joes and jinx and uh falcon and you know call it a day and then have tunnel wrap for your comic relief there you go so you know i think the marketing aspect of the film kind of Whole, in my opinion, is the thing that holds it back or held it back the most. And if they were to redo this and update this, I would hope that they would kind of map out which characters are going to actually have something to do with the story and actually use them. Kind of like in a G.I. Joe Resolute. You use them in the story according to their specialty and how that specialty would help them overcome whatever odds are in their face at the time. <laughs> In closing, I gotta say, G.I. Joe is, G.I. Joe the movie overall is a great film. It has all of the little factors that you can now see when you look back on the life of a real American hero. You can see why little kids all over the world, little boys, little girls, you know, kids from all over the world were so into G.I. Joe. It covered all the bases. It had the sci-fi elements. It had, you know, the comedy base or elements. It had uh, really good writing. Like, there's a line during this scene where uh, Galobulus says to Falcon, the last thing you will hear is the snapping of your vertebrae one by one. Th this is a kid's show, wasn't it? It's like they didn't insult the kid's intelligence with the writing. They, they tried to let you know, these are grown-ups dealing with grown-up stuff, and you're just privy to this. You're getting to see this. And I love that, because as a kid, it showed me that, you know, soldiers go through some shit, you know? Granted, I had a lot of family that's in the military, but as a kid, I didn't really know the details past this, because out of respect for us as children, they didn't tell us those stories. I mean, they told us, my I have an uncle that worked, I have two uncles that worked on different ships, and uh, both of them... I got to see the ships. One is more of a museum, which is the Intrepid. The other one is actually in service. And I got to see how these things work, and I got to see the guns, and I got to see stuff, but they didn't tell me, you know, who got killed with what, you know, who got shot down while they were trying to load up what weapons, you know, which bay got, you know, blew up with people in it, and they kept those kind of things away from us. So, you know, it, it was cool to see that it's serious on the show 
and get that idea. So they also, when you play with your figures, you were able to kind of reenact that kind of seriousness, you know? Um, there are just lots of, of cool things that when you revisit this show or this film, I'm sorry, as an adult, you know, and if you have kids and you revisit this and watch it with your kids, you get to see how things were done so differently back in the day, you know? Um, the animation, just the overall art direction in general. It looks like comics. It looks like, it even looks like somewhat like comics of today where you have longer proportions, you know, and it's closer to what people's proportions actually are in some cases, you know. A lot of times we do get the idealized proportions, but you have that in here too. I mean, look at Pythona, you know. It's just a mixture of so many cool things visually with the exception of Big Fucking Lob. Um, <laughs> so many cool things visually. I mean, there are horror elements to the designs of things in Cobra Law. That's awesome, you know? It's just so much variety visually, stimulating visuals. And then, you know, pretty well done writing. And just an overall, you know, good, fun ride that you're not bored watching the film. And that's pretty much all you can ask for from, you know, your entertainment. You want a decent ride, you know, that doesn't insult you along the way. And G.I. Joe the movie is exactly that. It shines brighter than a lot of other films because they didn't try to make things real. They didn't say this is the real world. They said this is the world in this story. And these things can happen in this world. They're not saying that there is a Cobra Law somewhere. They're not trying to tie everything into real life to the point where you have to fear that this is a possibility. They know it's fiction and they're like, yeah, this is this is for fun. This is this is all fantasy, you know? That's why I, I still, you know, and I always will bring this up whenever we talk G.I. Joe, is I don't understand how there are fans that don't understand that G.I. Joe is sci-fi, you know, it's fake, it's all fake, it's not the real military, because, you know, there are some certain basic things, you know, Sergeant Slaughter running into battle in a tank top with no gun, no nothing, no, no, that's not happening, you know what I mean, there's some basic level things, jetpacks, no, they don't even give you guys pistols and knives, you know, you gotta be a, a specific rank for those kind of things, and some of you don't even get body armor, and here you got jetpacks. <laughs> like, yeah. So I'm, I'm glad that I got to see this when I was a kid. And it's awesome to be showing this to my boys as kids now. So anyway, this has been a superhero film attack. I am Strident. The film was G.I. Joe the movie. The original G.I. Joe the movie. Um, that is my story and I'm sticking to it. I think this thing is just fun. It's just pure fun. Um, and it's been a while, so I'm glad you guys were here to check this out. Thanks for watching, and uh, I guess I will see you guys on the next video. Peace outside.